In the previous module, we looked at the position analysis of four bar mechanisms where all the joints are revolute joints. In this lecture, we will look at the position analysis of the slider crank mechanism. A slider crank mechanism converts between rotational motion and translational motion. There are two types of slider crank mechanisms, inline slider crank mechanisms and offset slider crank mechanisms. In inline slider crank mechanisms, the point P undergoes a translational motion which is along a line that passes through the fixed pivot marked with O2 here. In offset slider crank mechanism, there is a distance between the line of motion of the point D and the fixed pivot O2. Before we proceed to the position kinematics problem, I want to clarify one aspect of terminology here. Some authors are careful about using slider crank versus crank slider. When they use the term slider crank, they imply that the slider is the input link and the crank is the output link. When they use crank slider, they imply that the crank is the input link and the slider is the output link. However, in this class, we will not make such a distinction. We will always call the mechanism slider crank mechanism and we will explicitly state whether the slider is the input link or the crank is the input link. The position analysis in the next few slides will be for an offset slider mechanism which looks more like this. However, the general procedure can be applied to offset slider crank mechanisms of this form and we will see this in the homework. Of course, if the offset is zero, then we have the inline slider crank mechanism. So the analysis of the offset slider crank mechanism will hold for the inline slider crank mechanism with offset equals to zero. Let us now look at the formal problem statement of direct position kinematics for the slider crank mechanism. Given the link lengths A and B, where A is the link length of the crank, B is the link length of the coupler, the offset of the slider C, C is this length here, and the input angle theta 2, we have to compute the position of the slider D, which is this length, and the angle theta 3 shown in the picture. In this problem statement, we have assumed that the crank is the input link. So theta 2 is my independent variable or a variable that changes with time or as the mechanism moves but is known for the purposes of analysis. The method for solving this problem is same as what we have seen for the position kinematics of the four bar mechanism with all revolute joints. The first step is to write the vector loop closure equation. To write the vector loop closure equation, we have to assign a vector to each link. O2A is the vector assigned to link 2 or the crank and BA is the vector assigned to link 3 or the coupler and they are shown in this figure here. The position vector of the point B or RS is equal to O2A minus BA. Now here I have denoted O2A by R2 so I can write here R2 minus R3 where R3 denotes BA. Now one question that you may ask is why did I measure the angle theta 3 at the point B and not at the point A? In terms of the analysis, it doesn't matter. You could have chosen the angle either at point B or at point A. If you had chosen the angle at point A, then the definition of theta 3 would have been this and the vector would have been AB. However, 
the angle theta 3 being the angle between the slider and the coupler is more important practically when you think about transmission angles. So usually the analysis of slider crank mechanism is done with the choice of the vector BA. However, to repeat myself, it is not necessary to choose the vector as BA. The choice of AB would have been equally good. Now if we look at the vector RS, both its magnitude and its direction or the angle it makes with the x-axis changes as the slider moves. Now the vector RS can also be written as the sum of two vectors R1 and R4. Here the vector R4 is a constant vector and for the vector R1 its magnitude only changes that's the length d changes however its direction does not change it is constant so this is what we will use to form the final loop closure equations so we have rs equal to r2 minus r3 equals to r1 plus r4 therefore r2 minus r3 minus r1 minus r4 is equal to 0 this is my final loop closure equation and this is what is shown in this slide. The vectors R1 and R4 are shown here. The length of R4 is the offset length C and the angle here is theta 4. In this picture, the theta 4 is 90 degrees. Now the vectors R2, R3, R4 and R1 can be written in complex number form as shown here using the length and the angles of the corresponding vectors. Note here, that theta 4 and theta 1 are constants in particular for the figure shown here theta 1 is 0 degrees and theta 4 is pi by 2. If I substitute r1 r2 r3 r4 into the vector loop closure equation I get the following equation in complex exponential form. Before we proceed further we want to just reflect for a moment and identify all the constants the unknown variables and the independent variables. So the constants here are the link lengths a and b, the offset c, the angle theta 4 and theta 1. The independent variable is the crank angle theta 2 and the unknown variables that you have to find are the angle theta 3 and the displacement of the slider d. In this slide, I have first written down the vector loop closure equation in the complex exponential form. Now I will use Euler's formula which says e to the power of j theta equal to cos theta plus j sine theta to expand each one of these terms here. If I do that the first term gives me this, the second term gives me this, the third gives me this and the fourth gives me this. Now for this equation to be satisfied on the left hand side, both the real and the imaginary part must individually be zero. So from here, I can say that the real part is zero and the imaginary part is zero. So all the terms here that are not multiplied by j are the real part. a cos theta 2 goes here, b cos theta 3 goes here, c cos theta 4 goes here, and d cos theta 1 goes here. All the terms that are multiplied by j are the imaginary terms and they can be collected to form the second equation. Now recall that theta 1 and theta 4 are constants. In this case, theta 4 is pi by 2 and theta 1 is 0. Theta 1 is 0 implies that cos theta 1 equal to 1 and sine theta 1 is 0. Theta 4 equals to pi by 2 implies cos theta 4 equal to 0 sine theta 4 as 1. So from the first equation we get a cos theta 2 minus b cos theta 3 minus d equals to 0. From the second equation we get a sine theta 2 minus b sine theta 3 minus c equals to 0. So from the first equation I get d equals to a cos theta 2 minus b cos theta 3. 
I have to just take d to the right hand side here and I get this equation. Now recall here that the unknowns are d and theta 3. From the second equation, I do not have any d here. The only unknown is theta 3. So from this equation, I can solve for theta 3 directly. a, b, c and theta 2 are known. So from this equation, sine of theta 3 equal to a sine theta 2 minus c by b. Therefore, theta 3 is sine inverse a sine theta 2 minus c by b. And since there can be two solutions for the sine, theta 3 1 represents one of the solutions. The other solution will be obtained by noting that sine theta is same as sine pi minus theta or pi minus theta equals to arc sine of the term here. So theta equal to pi minus this term which is shown here. Once we have theta 3 1 and theta 3 2 we can substitute theta 3 1 or theta 3 2 in this equation here and get two values of d d1 and d2. So you should note here that the solution for the slider crank mechanism with the crank as the driver is simpler than the solution for the four bar mechanism that we did earlier. Now if we change the driver to be the slider instead of the crank, what happens? So in that case my independent variable becomes d and my unknown variables become theta 2 and theta 3. The angle that the crank makes with the x-axis and the angle that the coupler makes with the x-axis. So these two equations are same as before and noting that theta 1 equals to 0 and theta 4 equal to pi by 2 in this case. Cos theta 1 will be 1, sin theta 1 will be 0, cos theta 4 will be 0, sin theta 4 will be 1. So we get the first equation from the first equation on top and this equation from the second equation here. Just remember that theta 2 and theta 3 are my unknowns here. So these two equations are of the form a cos theta 2 plus b cos theta 3 plus c1 equal to 0 and a sin theta 2 plus b sin theta 3 plus c2 equals to 0. c1 is minus d, c2 is minus c, capital B is this minus small b, and capital A is the small a. The equations here is of the standard form of problem 2. So we can use the method in the supplementary notes or in the earlier lecture modules that you have seen to solve for theta 2 and theta 3. Now the methods that we have described here, they do not depend upon the actual values of theta 1 and theta 4. The coefficients that you will get will change a little bit depending on what theta 1 is and what theta 4 is. But the main method will remain the same. We will explore this further in the assignments. Now let us look at an example. In the figure, there is a slider crank mechanism with the crank as a driver. The length of the crank is 40 mm, length of the coupler is 120 mm and the offset length is 20 mm. The input crank angle equals to 60 degree and we want to find all values of the displacement d and the angle theta 3. So first just writing down the problem data a is 0 0.04 meter, b is 0.12 meter, c is 0 0.02 meter and theta 2 is 60 degrees. Now theta 1 equal to 0 and theta 4 equal to 90 degree for the mechanism given to us. Therefore I can just substitute all these values into my formula for angle theta 3 and I get the two solutions as 7 degree and 173 degrees. Then I take these two values and substitute in the expression for D to get D1 and D2. Now you will note here that D1 comes to be some negative quantity and D2 comes to be some positive quantity. So it would be interesting to see how the two configurations actually look. 
and that is left as an exercise to you to sketch the two solutions to understand how the two different solutions look.